to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. We live in a world that has a great deal of hysteria about demons and demon possession. What does the Bible say on the subject of demons? Does the Christian have to live in fear of demon possession? or demons still running around today and do they need to be exercised out of people? We welcome you today to our study of the subject of demons. In this special lesson, we're going to be thinking about what does the Old and New Testament teach on this subject, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. I want to encourage you to locate your Bible and have it handy as we're going to be looking to the Word of God to see what it has to say about this wonderful subject of demon possession. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by members and individual congregations of the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you'd like to have a Bible study, maybe you've got a Bible question, maybe you'd like to learn more about worship and how to serve God better, these people at the Lord's Church would love to sit down with you and study the Word of God. You'll find friendly, loving people there who are only concerned about God and His truth. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Word of God, won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our material free of charge. We have video, audio lessons, transcripts, study questions, just a good host of Bible study material that would be so beneficial for you in your study of God's Word. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, we make that available to you free of charge. Just visit our website, go to our media request form, and from there you can fill out a media request. You can either get a digital download or we'll even send you a hard copy of a DVD or CD free of charge. And friend, don't forget to download the Gospel of Christ app for both your Android and Apple smartphones from the respective stores. Those are a great way to study God's Word on the go. Today, as we're thinking about this subject, we mentioned earlier that there's so much mass hysteria about demon possession. And, and no doubt Hollywood has contributed to this with movies going way back like to The Exorcist, uh, movies like Insidious and Paranormal Activity, uh, The Conjuring about the, war, the case files of the Warren family, and then there's a host of books about it. There's even a book on exorcism for dummies, how to cast out demons, demon proofing your house and your prayer life. It, it, the Catholic Church has also made this a very popular idea where they claim to still be able to cast demons out of people and you can pay a certain amount of money and have a priest come over and bless you and your house and possibly do an exorcism related to that. And so let's think today about the most important question of all, Jeremiah 37 Verse number 17, what does the Scripture say? Or, as Paul worded it in Romans 4 verse 3, is there any word from the Lord? Here's what's unique about demon possession, and really demons in general. The study of demons is mostly a New Testament phenomena. That is, there's not a lot in the Old Testament about demon possession. There are four or five passages in the Old Testament that will mention demon possession. Uh, Leviticus 17 verse 7, Deuteronomy 32 verse 17, 
uh, 2 Chronicles 11, verse 15, and Psalm 106, verse 37. Four or five passages and their companion verses, and every one of them will associate demons with uh, worshiping false gods or making sacrifices to what the people would refer to then as evil spirits. But the mentioning of demons is very scarce in the Old Testament. And so today we're going to focus mostly on what the New Testament has to say on the subject of demon possession. Let's think about this idea. Demon possession mainly occurs or demons and the ideas about them mainly occur in the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament has a lot to say about demons. In the New Testament, demons are mentioned some 65 plus times. Of those 65 plus occurrences, listen to this, 55 of them occur in Matthew through John. What does that teach us? From this we learn that demons, demon possession, and their reign and, and purpose was somehow linked directly to the ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A lot of times people put a lot of focus into the origin of demons. But what does the Bible actually teach about their origin? Where did demons come from? The New Testament doesn't teach us a lot about their origins, but here are some things that we uh, learn. In the writing of Enoch, he believed demons were fallen angels. 2 Peter 2 verse 4, uh, Jude verse 6, Revelation 12 verses 7 and 9. It was his idea, again, not from Scripture, but it was his idea that those demons who sinned, who were cast in chains of darkness, were that great eternal day of judgment, that those angels were demons. Now again, nothing in Scripture to support that. Josephus and, and many of the Greeks in his day and age, they believed that demons were the spirits of evil men. Again, just giving some basic ideas that men thought during that time. Justin Martyr believed that they were the offspring of angels and men. The Nephilim and the men that they believe uh, had a race of people there, that's what Justin Martyr believed about that. But here's all we really know from the Bible. In truth, all we know is that they are spirit beings under the control and power of Almighty God. They are referred to in the New Testament. You have word, the words demon, unclean spirit, and evil spirit. All are used synonymously to refer to the same thing. So they're unclean or evil spirits whom God and the Lord Jesus Christ had absolute control over. Jesus could cast them out with a word. They saw Jesus coming and they identified Him as the Master and the Lord and uh, recognized His power and His authority. And so that's really all we know from the Bible about their origin. Now, what do we know about the nature of demons? What does the New Testament teach were some of their traits and characteristics? Here are just a few of them. In the New Testament, demons possessed the power of speech. Uh, let me give you one example. Luke chapter 4. I want you to notice Luke chapter 4, verses 33 through 37. We're going to see where demons in some ways had the ability through the person they possessed to speak. Luke chapter 4, verse number 33. Jesus is casting out an unclean spirit. Verse 33, now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of, un of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And so this demon in some ways had the ability to speak. Uh, demons had the uh, cognitive ability, the mental ability to recognize Jesus. Luke chapter 8 verse 28, they, the, 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 the demon would say again, we know who you are. You're the Son of God. And they would proclaim that. Although Jesus didn't want them doing that, they had in some way the ability in nature to recognize who He was. 
demons had a type of faith, but it was the wrong type of faith. James 2 verse 19 says this, Even the demons believe and tremble. Oh, they believed, they knew, but their faith did not cause them, uh, promote them to have the right type of action. Instead, they believed in Jesus and they just shuddered in fear. And so it's a type of faith, but not a correct type of faith. And yes, in the New Testament, part of the nature of demons was they had the ability to possess people. Mark chapter 1, they bring a person to Jesus who's possessed by an unclean spirit. And of course, all of us can recall Legion who was possessed by many demons that Jesus cast out in Mark chapter 5. Now, as we think about the nature of demons though, in the Bible, certain doctrines were referred to as demonic. For example, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, Paul said some were giving heed to the doctrines of demons, which included forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving. For he'll go on to say it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. The idea that you couldn't, that marriage was wrong and that a person couldn't eat certain foods, if it tasted too good, it might be wrong. That was labeled as a demonic or unclean doctrine. Now, in the Bible, what's unique about demons is that sometimes they aggressively and actively sought after people to possess. For example, look in Matthew chapter 12, verse number 43. Demons were aggressive at times with their nature. Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 43. The Bible says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. When we think about uh, the activity of demons, when they were cast out, they weren't content and they were aggressively looking for a new host. Demons also tormented people. Luke chapter 6, verse number 18, there was a, an individual there who for many years had been tormented by his demon, by the demons that possessed him. Like the man in Mark chapter 5, Legion, he would cut himself, he would cry out, he lived in the cemetery, nobody could chain him. That was a horrible life to live under demon possession. And then of course, were it not the right person with the right faith casting out demons in the New Testament, they would even attack the person trying to do that. Do you remember the uh, Jewish exodus, exorcist, Acts 19 verse 13? We implore you by the name of Paul, come out and uh, those demons attacked those people who tried to do that. Well, they didn't have the right faith and they hadn't put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they weren't able to do that and the demons attacked them because of that. Now, when you think of demon possession, Many times the demon would uh, completely possess the individual and have control over that person, control their actions, uh, control their thoughts, would just have many times total control over the, uh, cast them into a fire sometimes with a seat. We remember reading examples of that. And sometimes in the New Testament there was um, sickness that would be associated with that. There was a man in Matthew 8 verse 28 who was, for the lack of a better term, was kind of a maniac, a crazy man. And it was attributed to the unclean or the evil spirits. And there was something occurring like under epilepsy maybe or a seizure and it would uh, cast him into the fire even sometimes and the unclean spirit was related to that. In Matthew 17, verse 15, there was a man who was mute, uh, couldn't speak. And in Matthew 9, verse 32, we learn that demons had a part to play in that. But let's also understand that something that was unique in the New Testament is that a person could be possessed by more than one demon at a time. Do you remember again, Mark chapter 5, uh, legion, uh, we are legion for we are many. He was possessed by multitude of demons. Uh, Luke chapter 8 verse uh, 2, Mary Magdalene, it is told, had seven demons. And in Luke 11 verse 26, when they cast some out, seven worse came back and took over that individual. 
Now, as we're thinking on the subject of demons, we can say, okay, all that information is good, that we've understood some things about demons, but what's that got anything to do with us today? Friend, it is my conviction from studying the New Testament that demon possession occurred specifically for Jesus Christ to show His power over evil, over that which is unclean, and over Satan himself. It occurred for Jesus to show He was the master of evil over evil, and He was the master over demons. Jesus, no doubt, was the master exorcist. He could cast out demons on various occasions and in various ways. For example, Matthew 8, verse 16, Jesus cast them out with only a word. Nobody could do that. Jesus just said the word, and immediately they were cast out. We look in Matthew 11, verse number 28, and the Lord through prayer cast out demons. Jesus would say prayer and would cast out the demons as well. But I think we see this most graphically in Mark chapter 5. You remember the man that we spoke about multiple times today who carried the name Legion. Uh, he had a multiplicity of demons in him. And the demons recognize Jesus. They know his power and they know what he's about to do. And so they plead with Jesus, don't cast us into the abyss. Uh, and so G there's a group of swine feeding over there, and they say, Did you cast us into the, they ca Jesus cast all them into that herd of swine, and they run violently and jump off the cliff into the ocean, as it were. Not just one, but a multiplicity at one time. Now, that shows us, as we said, of the 65 mentions of demons in the New Testament, 55 occur in the life and ministry of Jesus. They were tied directly to Jesus' ministry, and that shows us His power over demons, over evil, and ultimately over Satan. Now, there's so much said today in our world about exorcism that I want us to think about what was exorcism like in the Bible. There were some who could not cast out demons. Acts 19 verse 13, the Jewish, Jewish exorcists tried to appeal uh, to the faith of Paul and ultimately Jesus to cast out demons and instead those demons attacked them. So not everybody, even in the New Testament, could do that. Jesus did give power to some of His followers in the New Testament to do that. Matthew chapter 10, when he would send uh, some of his disciples out on the commission, the limited commission, uh, he gave them that power. And then, of course, in Matthew 17, verse 21, we learn that some demons were harder to cast out than others. Look at Matthew chapter 17, and I want you to see this passage with me. Some demons were a little harder for Jesus' disciples than others. Matthew 17, look at verses 19 through 21. The disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? Jesus did it. He rebuked the demon, cast it out. Why could we not cast it out, they said. Verse 20, Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief or lack of faith. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now watch this. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And so some uh, demons were a little harder to cast out than others. Now, let's come to the question that we want to let the Bible answer that's probably at the forefront of every one of our thoughts today. Do demons exist today? Do I need to live in fear of demon possession? Is it the case that somehow, like in the New Testament, uh, a demon is going to enter me and possess me and take over my whole life and body? Friend, here's what we can learn. We'll see this from Scripture 
all demon possession has ended. The Bible will clearly teach us that, and we'll show you the verse. Demons are no longer something I've got to live in fear of today. It's not something that's going to happen. Someone says, okay, how can we be sure of that? Well, here's how. The Bible explicitly and emphatically says that we're not living in the day and age of demon possession. You say, okay, now show me that scripture. Look in your Bible in Zechariah chapter 13, and I want you to look in verses 1 through 3. This is such a clear passage as it relates to Jesus, the cleansing that happened on the cross, and what else happened at that same time. Look in Zechariah 13. I want you to look in verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> That's Zechariah chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. In that day, now he's going to tell us what day it is. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. Now, let's stop right there. In that day, fountain's going to be opened for the house of David for sin and uncleanliness. What fountain was open for sin in that day that Zechariah is prophesying about for the house of David? Well, there's only one fountain that was open for sin. John 19 verse 34, when that soldier took that sword and pierced the side of Jesus and blood and water flowed out, that fountain for sin and cleansing was opened up. And so this is a definite prophecy about Jesus Christ and His blood and cleansing that would heal all men from sin. Now, here's what else I want you to know. If that's the case, Watch verses 2 and 3. We've set the time frame to the ministry and lifetime of Jesus, right? Now watch verse 2 and 3. It shall be in that day, same time frame, when Jesus' blood is shed, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the name of idols from the land. They shall no longer be remembered. Now watch this. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. If you study Jewish history, the Jews no longer worshiped idols. They'd had that problem in the past, but when we come to the New Testament, idolatry, they learned that lesson from captivity, and they're no longer involved in that. Prophecy is all God calls. We're no longer living in a day and age where somebody can prophesy like they could in the New Testament. We're not living in that time frame. God said that would come to an end also. Also, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10, uh, when that which is perfect has come, the complete law of liberty, James 1, 25, that which is in part, prophesying, tongue speaking, miraculous knowledge, the Bible says it would cease. We're not living in the day and age where there are prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Jesus running around telling us things from God. We have the full revealed will of God today. And so idols ceased. New Testament prophecy, that's something that occurred in the New Testament, not today. But now watch this. Look at verse number 3 again. And God says, He would call, cause the unclean spirits to depart from the land. Are we living in a day and age today where demons are running around trying to possess people? Not of Zechariah 13. Verses 1 through 3 is true. When that fountain, listen to it again now, when that fountain for sin and uncleanliness was opened, that's the blood of Christ, flowed down from Calvary and Golgotha, and that ties so beautifully and uniquely into the ministry of Jesus. Why is there such an influx of demon possession? They know their time's about up. Jesus is going to cast them out, and that's no longer going to occur. When that fountain was opened, Idols were done away with for the Jewish people. Prophecy uh, came to an end. No longer New Testament prophets running around, and the unclean spirit was caused to depart from the land. Friend, you can take a deep breath. You can take a sigh of relief. We are not living in the day and age where demon possession is something I have to live in fear of. Demons were mainly 
a New Testament phenomenon. They existed to show the power of Christ over Satan and, of course, the forces of Satan. Then we know this. Jesus was the ultimate master exorcist, and he had all power over demons. There was not a demon in hell that had more power than the Son of God. And, of course, he's greater than Satan as well, the master of the demon world. And then we know this, demon possession has ended. Someone may say something like this today. You know, that fella, he's having a hard time. He just can't get rid of his demons. And what we mean by that is, when we're talking literally, he's got a lot of sin problems in his life that he's yet to let go of. But those demons are not causing, like they were in the New Testament, those problems. We're not living in that day and age today. What then do I need to live in fear of? What do I need to think carefully about? Friend, we encourage you today not to be caught up in the hysteria that some of the religious world promotes today about demon possession, but rather, let's make sure that we give our lives to Almighty God, that we give our lives in possession to God, that we really let Christ have control of our lives, that we have made ourselves slaves and servants of Almighty God. How do we do that? God be thanked, Paul said, that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Have you obeyed the gospel, my friend? Are you a New Testament? Have you submitted your life to the one has, who has power over hell and all the demons in it? If not, we urge you to today. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? John chapter 8, verse 24. Would you repent and turn from sin to God? Luke 13, verse 3. Would you make that great confession like the Ethiopian eunuch? I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and to have every sin washed away. Would you do what Jesus said? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Don't live in fear of demons. Rather, let's live in fear of God and give our lives wholly to Almighty God. Join us next time as we're going to study more from the Word of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.